everybody. It's Sam Bennett from therealsambennett.com and welcome to this weekly Facebook Live. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to see you. Um, I'm having a lot of weird technical problems lately. I was having trouble getting into the meeting and then uh, I sent the email late, like crazy town, crazy town. Um, but, uh, but we're here now <laughs> on my old computer and um, we're gonna start the way we start everything which is with this breathing, with this moment of centering, with a moment of leaning into the truth of who you are in this moment, this exact body, this exact mind, this exact spirit, this exact mood. Where you are now is where you are. And if you want it to transform, the first thing you might wanna do is stop fighting it. Just drop your shoulders, drop into the truth. Drop into the truth of your body, you drop into the truth of your mind, drop into the truth of your world. See if you can exist peacefully with the truth. And if the truth is, I don't know, then let the truth be, I don't know. And if the truth is, I'm unhappy, then let the truth be, I'm unhappy. This is not some other Zoom. This is not some obligation. This is a moment for you to commune deeply with yourself, to uncover things about yourself so that you can participate more fully in life because that's what we're here for, to participate in life. That's the whole agenda. You can't do it wrong. You can't do it poorly. And even refusing to participate in life is still participating in life. But for right now, you can drop all of it. You don't have to be anybody's parent. You don't have to be anybody's friend. You don't have to be anybody's boss. You don't have to be pretty or smart or good or talented. You can just be. So. Let's inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Thank you for doing that with me. How does it feel to just be? How does it feel to just allow? How does it feel to release the idea that you should be doing something other than what you're doing? Or that you should be someone different than the person that you are and always have been? Itchy, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's a real safety in clinging to those, um, those old beliefs, those old identities, that voice that says, you're not doing it right. Be better, work harder, right? It feels like, you know, if we know what our obligations are, then we feel safe. But the fact of the matter is we don't have any obligations. Not a radical thought. We don't have any obligations. You don't have an obligation to your family. You don't have an obligation to the planet. You don't have an obligation. And we can tell this because we see people, you know, um, uh, abdicate their responsibilities all the time. We judge them, <laughs> but we see it, right? Robin says, great start. Heard what I already needed to feel today. Good, good. Hi, Julie. Big hug back to you. 
Hi, Shirley. Hi, Lucy. Uh, Johnny, hi. Hi, Clark. Happy St. Patrick's Day, indeed. Good morning, Laurie. Uh, I have an obligation to be here at 10 o'clock every Thursday. No, you have a choice. You made a choice to be here. You made a choice to be here. Um, and it's a great shortcut to happiness is to remember that you are always at choice. And uh, you are uh, doing pretty much exactly what you want to do pretty much all the time. Pretty much everybody is, which is weird because we don't feel like we're doing what we want to do, but you are, you know? There's someone in my life who's making choices right now that I'm like, these are crazy choices. How can, you know, how can you do this? But the fact of the matter is she's doing exactly what she wants to do and exactly the way she wants to do it, just like me, just like you. And it's true, being in this place of total freedom, like, oh, wow, I can pick my identity. I can pick my obligations. I can pick my mood. You're not in control of everything that happens, certainly. But you're in control of almost everything that happens up here. St. Patrick's Day and also Purim. Well, happy Purim. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> um, it's a nice match, you know, good mix up for people who are both Irish and Jewish, right? Um, I don't imagine that's a huge population, but there must be some. So, yay. <laughs> um, how, what are those cookies called? The Hamler? Ham, oh, I'm not going to say it. I don't know the word. Um, and in Chicago, of course, they dye the river green. So, Judy says, actually, the mayor of Dublin was Jewish. Well, there you go. Patrick and Haman both wear weird hats. Hamantaschen. Thank you, Judy. I knew you would know. And I just, I just saw Mayim Bialik on TikTok the other day talking about Purim. And uh, she said it's a thing to get, you know, it's about what's hidden and what needs to be uncovered or discovered. And uh, that it's a thing to, uh, get a, to get a little drunk, to have a little cocktail. So it's, it's, again, it's a good matchup. Um, hi, Laura. Great to see you. Carol says, truth, we cannot choose for or control others. We can only accept where we are at choice in the now. Well, exactly, exactly. Jesus, it's a commandment to be so drunk that you don't know up from down. Well, that's an invitation, isn't it? Um, so let, I have a few little, I just want to let you know about some things that are coming up. I'm going to do a, just a little one day, half day course um, in April, at the end of April, um, about your organizing principle, about how to make the one decision that makes all the other decisions easy. If you are in Get It Done Lab, you're getting that automatically. Um, if you are not in Get It Done Lab, you will have the opportunity to opt in for that. Um, uh, it'll, it'll, it's, I think we said it was going to be 197 or something. So it's not, it's, um, uh, who says in Syracuse, there's an intersection at the top of the hill that puts the green light at the top of the traffic light. Oh, that's funny. Um, for St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we will have a new Get It Done Lab starting in June. So if you're feeling like, oh, I really wish I had taken advantage of that the last two times, you will have another opportunity. Um, and we had a really fun uh, team meeting the other day. And uh, I think we're going to offer a Get Your Book Done course this summer. Um, in July. So if you've been wanting to work with me, this is a good time to start a little penny jar because um, I try to price my courses as, as reasonably as, as possible, but they do. But I also want to get your attention. You know, I don't want it to be so inexpensive that you can blow it off. Um, so, you know, start a penny jar. Okay. Um, when I was thinking about today, I was thinking about the three sort of self-help things that have really made a difference in my life. Oh, June says Leopold Bloom of Dublin, hero of Ulysses. Right, of course. Very good. Um, oh, that's great, Veronica. Thank you. She says, uh, yes, therealsambennett.com forward slash lab, L-A-B, to get on the waiting list for the next lab. Um, we're seeing some amazing results um, last time. This time, people are getting projects finished. They're switching projects. They're realizing that what they started working on is really what they need to be working on. They're 
but they're in it, you know, they're, um, they're, 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 they're taking big bites. So um, yeah, I'd love to see you in the next Get It Done Lab if you're interested. Um, Cause you know, the thing about all this self-help stuff and I know it, you know, it may cause some eye rolls from your family or from the rest of the world. <laughs> um, uh, certainly self-help is not as popular in other countries even as it is, um, as it is here in, in Southern California where I live. Uh, but it actually works. You know, you can actually change your life. Um, I, and I just had an example of that the other day. I was in a situation that, gosh, even 10 years ago, I think would have really freaked me out. I think I would have been like, the habit trail in my mind would have been going crazy, um, running around in circles. And I act, and, but I felt fine. I was like, oh, look at that. Look, that's progress. That's the, your little personal growth milestone. I'm gonna plant a little flag here and look around and go, hey, look at me. I am better than I was. I'm calmer. I'm more um, myself. I'm more um, confident, maybe. Um, certainly more peaceful. That's really what I am. I'm more peaceful than I was. Um, yes, big bites or lots of little nibbles, as June says. Yes, lots of little nibbles. So I thought I would share three of the deepest ones with you. You've probably heard these before, but the great thing about self-help is that every time you come to a truth, it's true for you in a new way. So you can do a little dive in these and they sort of stack up on top of each other. Um, the first one is something I learned from my friend and colleague, David Nagel. Uh, he quotes an, uh, a self-help guy from the twenties named Leland Val van der Waal. Leland Val van der Waal. And uh, the quote is something like, the amount of success that a person has is directly proportional to the amount of truth that they can stand to hear about themselves without running away. The amount of success that a person experiences in life is directly proportional to the amount of truth that they can stand to hear about themselves without running away. Where is your capacity to hear truth about yourself? Where is your capacity to hear criticism or compliments and say, yes, that's true? To not fight it, to not feel ashamed, to not rush to explain, Just say, yes, that's true. Is there a truth about yourself that you have been resisting? Is there a truth that the world's been trying to tell you and you've been pushing it away? No, 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 no. Get that truth away from me. One way to do it is, is, you know, my favorite trick with the word sometimes, right? You're selfish, sometimes. You're the most wonderful person in the world, sometimes. And you can see how a relaxed acceptance of truth could lead a person to greater success. both personal and professional. Not that there's a difference between those two things. <laughs> the second one I was reminded of the other day, which is you always win the game you're playing. You always win the game you're playing which is uh, I think from uh, neuro-linguistic programming, uh, it's an NLP thing. And the 
uh, and the idea is just that you always win the game you're playing. So if the game you're playing is no one appreciates me, congratulations, you will always win that game. You will always find a way to feel underappreciated. If the game you're playing is I work and I work and I don't get anywhere, congratulations, you will always find a way to feel overworked and like you're not making progress. If the game you're playing is I have to do everything around here, then congratulations, you will always win the game of having to do everything around you. So this would be one of those truths <laughs> that you need to be able to not run away from in order to achieve greater success, right? Anybody wanna fess up about a game they play? That they're always winning? That I'm the only one who does work in my household. Yeah. Yeah. That I'll never get the book written, but that's changing when they get it done lab. Good for you, Lori. Yeah. Yeah, Shawnee, that I'm the only one who does work in my household. Is it, you know, <laughs> I think it's a very common game. I think a lot of us play that game. And um, admitting to ourselves that it is a game, that we're, we're um, that first of all, it's not true. There are other people in your house who do things, right? That you are at choice about what you do or do not do in your household. And that there's plenty of ways to get work done around the house without you having to do it. Or that you love it. That you, that you love doing it. I mean, I cook pretty much every meal we eat um, because I like to. I don't have to, I like to. That's what we used to say to the kids when I was a camp counselor. You don't have to, you get to. <laughs> uh, I'm too busy or broke to do work on my own stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to be busy all the time with other people's stuff um, because I can't, yeah, I can't possibly take the time to work on my own stuff now. Even though we know the investment that you would make in your own work is in fact a, a much better strategy for success right, than relying on work from other people. I'm too tired right now to write a screenplay. Congratulations, you will win that game every time. You will win that game every time. So, this is not on the three that I put in here, but I'll, I'll, I'll add it because we, we talk about it all the time, is what if the opposite is true? What if the opposite is true? Um, Sorry, there's an animal in the field out here and I can't tell if it's a cat or a possum. <laughs> but it must be a cat because a possum wouldn't be out in the day like this, would it? No. Um, <clears throat> Tony says, that's interesting. I like to do work because I feel like I have to be busy to be worthwhile, even if I'm outwardly complaining, mind blown. Yeah. Well, this is what we were talking about at the beginning, right? This, this, we cling to these identities of, of I'm a hard worker or I'm a dutiful daughter or I'm a good mother or I'm a good spouse or I'm um, a hard worker or you know whatever it is. And we cling to those identities because they feel safe. We do like that feeling of gratification, right? We do like that feeling of approval even self-approval and but when you drop it, and sometimes you're forced to drop it, you know, when you're unwell, when you're ill, then you have to, you know, you have to lay in bed, you get some good lessons on surrender. You get some good lessons on unhooking the idea that your worth is related to your doing, right? You know, and that a person who works, and that there's some, and even if there's some value in complaining, right? It depends what family you grew up in. Some, some families, in my family, complaining was not allowed. If you if you had a complaint, you better turn it into a suggestion and fast. You bet you know if you had a complaint, you better have a solution. Um, complaining was not allowed. Other families, complaining is all they do. <laughs> like, it's a big part of the, it's a big part of their family culture of just bitching and moaning and complaining all the time. Um, you know, it's it's a choice. So. Uh, 
you know, we sometimes we like that feeling. So what can you drop? What part of the game can you drop? Can you, you know, drop the part about doing? Can you drop the part about complaining? Can you drop all of it? Um, can you uh, drop the part about, you know, yeah, Crystal says I'm fighting cancer. So you're correct, right? Exactly. There are times in our lives, and and progressively as we get older, that our doing is it, it's not possible. It's not physically possible to do. So who are you then? Who are you when you are not doing? You know, when we when we take people to Belize, um, which we filled those two slots by the way. So we've got a full full hand, full group going to Belize in May. Um, but we've got a new. I think we're going to do another. Um, uh, Caribbean retreat, uh, not in Belize, but somewhere else, um, in February, 2023. So again, start a penny jar and come with, a, come with Amy and I on retreat. But one of the things we do on Belize, and I think we talked about this last week, is we take people to a deserted island and, and, and send them off to where they can't see anybody else. So you can have this experience of like, who are you when no one knows where you are? Who are you when no one needs anything from you? Who is that person and what does she want? What decisions does she wanna make for her life? And not letting her circumstances make her decisions for her, not letting other people's expectations make her decisions for her. Not letting societal expectations make her decisions for her. What is the truth about yourself that you can stand with, on, in, and not run away from? What games are you willing to stop playing? And then the final one I wanted to talk about is that the problem you think you have is just a symptom of the problem you have. Julie says she's it's the compliments I swat away the quickest. Right, oh no, that's, oh no, get that away from me. No, no, get that money away from me. No, no, get that praise away from me. Can you sit with the truth of it? Practice. My game is I don't have time. Yeah. Shirley says me too. Yeah. Laura says people won't get my work belonging. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've got I got a big one around that. I don't belong. I don't fit in. Nobody gets me. I don't. I don't. I don't. This is not my home planet. <laughs> <clears throat> and congratulations, you will win that game every single fucking time. So what if the opposite is true? Everybody gets your work. What if the opposite is true? You belong. You 100% belong. What if the opposite is true? You have all the time in the world. What if the opposite is true? You have all the energy you need to write a screenplay. What if the opposite is true? You are absolutely getting that book done. This is not my own planet. Yeah, for real, right? I'm a princess in my own in my own land. <laughs> and we all, you know, you guys are. You're special. You're all, you were, you know, your poor parents thought they were having just another kid, right? You probably have siblings who are slightly more ordinary than you are. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And, um, you know, and then they had you, a little sparkly unicorn child. Like they did the best they could. But let's face it, you are unusual. There are plenty of ways in which you don't belong, but there's plenty of ways in which everybody doesn't belong. You are special. Everyone is special. Right? And, you know, we highly creative people, we get very attached to our special. We get very attached to our weird. We get very attached to the no one gets me. What if we're willing to drop that game? Laurie says, congratulations on the Belize trip. Have a meaningful time. We will. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. The opposite is there's plenty of time. Exactly. And again, the, the problem you think you have is a symptom of the problem you have, right? So if, the th if you think the problem you have is, I don't have enough time, that's actually just a symptom. The actual problem is you're not willing to prioritize your own work. The actual problem is you're not willing to say no to 
some other obligation. The actual problem is you're not willing to trust your own voice. Right, when I was working more with creative entrepreneurs, I get this all the time. I don't have enough clients, I don't have enough clients. Like, that's not the problem. The problem is not that you don't have enough clients. The problem is you are not making enough sales calls. I don't have enough clients. They're like, well, how many people did you call this week? Nobody. Okay. <sighs> that, that would probably be <laughs> the root cause of the problem. And then what's, the, what's, what's that a symptom of? I'm not confident in my own, in, in my own work. I feel, I feel self-conscious talking about myself. Great, let's work on that. Let's get some practice. Nobody, nobody's born feeling confident talking about themselves. You have to work at it. You have to rehearse. You have to do it badly until you can do it well. Are you willing to be bad at it for as long as it takes to get good at it? Because this is the other thing with highly creative people and highly productive people is that we're good at, we're, we're used to being good at a lot of things. We're used to being able to sort of, you know, pick stuff up pretty quickly and, and, and have a lot of talents and skills and not have to struggle too hard to, to learn to master things, but something, and then, so then we don't learn very much in the way of patience with ourselves. <laughs> we don't have a high tolerance for not being good at things. You know, I, when I was working, when I was working as an actor full-time, I had a, a, a friend in my theater company, um, great guy and a very good actor uh, who had very severe dyslexia. So he had to write out every script in different colored pens by hand with sort of special markings for him to learn the words. And he would record the script, the entire script and play it on a, on a at the time it was like a Walkman or whatever. Um, and that's how hard he had to work to learn his lines. Now, I'm a very quick study. I learn lines like that. I, I you know, never had to struggle to learn lines. Um, I'd usually memorize the whole play by the time rehearsals were done. Um, and I was like, oh my God, if I had to work that hard to learn lines, I would never have become an actor. <laughs> I would have been like, oh no, this is too hard. I can't do this. <laughs> right? But he was willing to be bad at it for as long as it took to get good at it. So these questions are invitations for you. They're moments of inquiry and all the obstacles and all the problems and all the complaints are doorways to a better future. The things you think are your problems is in fact the doorway to a better future. So get in there, get underneath the symptoms of the problem, the patterns that you run, the games that you're playing. Get underneath, get to the truth. And if you need help, like do like that right hand, left hand thing, use whatever divination things you like. You know, sometimes it can be helpful to have a tarot deck or something else or a spiritual guide or, you know, prayer meditation time, whatever it is that works for you, right? Um, Veronica says, I had an easier time memorizing melodies than I did reading music, so I never really got good at sight reading, drove my violin teacher nuts. See, and I can't memorize a melody to save my life. I have studied music in one way or another almost my entire life. I took piano and guitar as a kid, I sang in choirs, I've been in musicals, and I could not sing, and I, I wrote a musical for God's sake, and I still can't, I can't hear and sing a melody back to you. It's weird. Um, Lori says, most of the stuff I've written in the past, I could write it and not much edits at all. So writing a book, every writer writes a terrible first draft and reading my first draft that is crappy, I think I can't write. Now that I have that statement about terrible first drafts written across my computer, it's not that I can't write, I just can't write a finished book on the first try. Yes, and Crystal's saying, Lori, that's so good. It is, it's so good. Yeah, yeah, when you're used to being doing something fairly deftly and then all of a sudden you hit some roadblocks. Yeah, yeah. But so we go back to beginner's mind, right? We go back to that calm, centered truth. Because the truth is the world needs your work. No, no, that's not true. I need your work. That's true. <laughs> I want to see it. 
I want to read that book. I'm ready. So thank you for being with me here today. Um, as always, uh, if you are not on our mailing list, make sure you join the mailing list at therealsambennett.com. If you are not in the Facebook group, hop into the Facebook group. Um, we like these things to cross pollinate each other. Um, and, uh, you know, let me know what's, what's going on. We're here to help. Veronica, as always, thank you so much for your, your, your support and your wisdom. Um, yeah, I feel very lucky to know all of you. Should we do one more breath? Let's inhale. Two, three, four, fold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for doing this with me.